Welcome everyone. It's really, really, really great to see you all. Um, and it's particularly wonderful to have this, this great panel here. I think you all know um, who these people are, but I'm going to introduce you anyway. My name is Rosie Goldsmith, as you may know. Um, I, for the purposes of this, I am the director of the European Literature Network. I'm also a journalist, and um, I am very proud to be a journalist. I think it's a rather uh, challenging time at the moment in Europe. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about does culture matter? Does culture matter to us in the UK uh, and in the rest of Europe? Does culture matter in the current UK-Europe debate? Now, so far as we know, politics and economics have more or less dominated the debate. Uh, we've heard very little about culture, but do they dominate the debate in the rest of Europe? Does culture possibly matter more in the rest of Europe? Is anyone listening to artists and writers at all? And you know, does anyone ever listen to what artists and writers say in public and uh, in public life and society? Now, these are very simple questions, um, but the answers are very, very complicated. The answer for me is very simple. I do believe culture matters, and um, I also want to introduce you to some people who will hopefully convince you it does. No pressure on any of them to change the direction of any debate um, at all, but it's a very topical debate, and um, I'm very lucky to um, have with me some of my favorite um, European writers and thinkers, and luckily for me, they also um, happen to be some of the most influential. Um, they all happen to be extremely brilliant writers as well. And they're going to discuss the um, importance of arts, literature, history, language, however they interpret culture in the context of what I call the current crisis in Europe. And of course, you're going to get a dose of real culture tonight. You're going to hear readings from them as well because they just happen to be best-selling, prize-winning, um, wonderful, brilliant writers and performers. So welcome to our great Europeans. Welcome to our Eurostars. Welcome. Thank you. We have Alison Kennedy next to me, A.L. Kennedy. We have Naomi Sechi um, from Hungary. Alison's from England and Scotland. Scotland, primarily. <laughs> um, I'll, let her, I'll let her sort of work out which corner she defends at the moment. Um, and we have the wonderful Naomi Sechi um, from Hungary as well. We have um, Gert Mack, Gert Mack, all the way from um, the Netherlands, um, one of our great Europeans. We have the great Gianrico Carafilio um, from Bari, Puglia, Italy. And we have the supremissimo Misha Glenny. Misha Glenny um, from London, England, Europe, the world. <laughs> welcome, welcome to all of them. We are at this pretty major turning point in um, the life of our country, um, and we have a big decision to make. Um, do you, Alison, want to put yourself down on one side or the other? Oh, yeah, I'm, al I'm allowed to, right. Uh, no, you're allowed to, as long as there's no sort of um, personal... I, c I can't say I want all the Tories to leave. Yeah. Everybody yeah. else could <laughs> remain. No, I would be in favour of remaining. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, the British people in the audience uh, will be aware. Uh, there's been a, a move since the 70s to sort of unravel all of the achievements that were set up at the end of World War II, one of which was the idea that there would be an organisation and a legal system that would protect Europe from eating itself again. Do you think culture matters yeah, well, in this I mean, debate? Uh, yeah, you, you were saying who's listening. I mean, the thing is that people listen to... Even in Britain, people listen to writers all the time, but they're um, Do they? the loudest, well, the loudest, they're people who are writing things down, shall we say. Uh, the loudest voices are voices which I would say are doing the opposite of art, which is to say they're voices that are saying you are unlike the people around you, um, you cannot understand people who aren't you, you are alone, um, you are in danger. Uh, trust us and we will give you the solutions to your problems. Uh, our media landscape is controlled by very few minds uh, with very particular uh, agendas and um, it's very toxic and the thing about culture and why it matters and why you have the European Union being established uh, and why some of the terrible things happened uh, that happened in uh, 
World War II was so easy uh, to eventually arrange was that you, you developed a toxic culture that allowed terrible things to happen very easily and allowed people who were perfectly normal and reasonable to do terrible things. You can't just make that happen by sprinkling people with pixie dust. You marinate them in hatred. You marinate them in fear everybody, you're by yourself, nobody's like you, you can't understand them particularly and them and they took your biscuits and now we have to all be quite angry and defensively aggressive because we're all about to be attacked uh, by the mysterious other. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a historically repeating pattern because there aren't enough sociopaths around. If you, if you want people to be terrible, there, there aren't enough of them. You have to make normal people be sociopathic. You do that with culture and fear. I think um, I would define real art as being a transcendent and remarkable thing, but sloppy propagandistic art is not without power. Um, and unfortunately, that's what we're getting a lot of. And it drowns out. You know, I, I remember the first time I went, actually the first time I went to the East was Hungary. And I don't think I was especially wandering around going, I'm from a democracy. <laughs> we know about this stuff, freedom and things. Um, you know, <laughs> it was sort of after the fall of the war, but um, it was very soon after the fall of the war. And this guy very nicely and politely said, yes, yes, you all have free speech. You all talk at once and nobody listens. <laughs> It's like, ooh, I, I, I was being superior. A Damn. Good, a good handover, though, to Naomi Cheshire. I'm yeah. actually from, um, from Hungary. And it is it, just to hear your, I mean, you, from Hung Hungary itself um, is... It's a mystery. Is it, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say mystery. How are you seen in Hungary? I mean, how are writers viewed in Hungary? It is very important uh, today now uh, in Hungary to, to have politics in art. So this is, this is something you, you cannot leave out. My, uh, my impression is that uh, sometimes it's, it's very uh, depressing uh, to have uh, um, uh, literature um, dirtied by, by uh, politics. And uh, if you want to have your voice heard, um, in Hungary, as a writer, you have to talk about politics all the time, uh, and uh, it's it's very, very depressing, really, uh, because you feel that if you you want to make this pure art, then no no one no one will listen to your words. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you are, um, it, it's, you, you're as close to a national treasure as, um, as, as the Dutch have, I think. I mean, you are, you're constantly talking in public and, and our, your opinion is asked all the time. You write articles. I mean, you, your voice does matter. The thing is, perhaps, when we talk about, it is not about me, but when we talk about uh, uh, culture in Europe, I think it is very important to realise that, 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 culture, especially literature, is typically international, European. And it is bringing us together. Of course, a lot, a lot of cultural differences on, an, on another level, but uh, always, uh, indeed, when you're looking at, at Holland from, from the beginning of the 17th century, the, 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 that culture of painters and mus musicians and literature, it was all in that time already international. And, and they were in, Rembrandt was influenced enormously by the Italians and they influenced the British again. So it, this, this dynamic is always very, has always been very important. Just two weeks ago, of course there is national culture too. Two weeks ago I walked through Versailles. I had to be, been before as a schoolboy and it is very impressive still. But it was a typical example of national culture and it was like you walk through a, a pawn shop. It was totally dusty. It was not, in fact, not interesting at all. That's the first thing. And I think the second thing is culture is at the moment very important. And I and that is also because in, in a lot of countries, the, the culture is suppressed because it is a counterforce. <laughs> it is to totally uh, neoliberal. And it is only uh, talks about uh, 
let's say, about money and the way uh, how you are thinking about money. So all the priorities are also, you have to, yeah, the, the priorities are less and less human. And I think culture can be and must be an enormous counterforce. So I understand totally this, this European Union and British problem, but it is also a problem of the European Union, that the European Union is always both talking about technical stuff and about culture as something That's different. Me. Yeah, That's so me. different, but it is all politics. And we need to have cultural and also political discussions mixed with each other. Gianrico, I mean, I mean, do, do you, when you listen to what Chiat is saying, do you, in, in Italy, I mean, this is a rhetorical question because I know Italy quite well, but describe, I mean, describe to me how you, how intellectuals, how people like you are viewed in Italy. I mean, Gianrico Carafiglio is, is a very well-known pub public figure in Italy because he um, was an anti-mafia judge in um, Puglia, prosecutor in Puglia. Actually, he was a, a senator in um, it Italy as well. He um, then, uh, as far as I understand, started writing um, crime novels as a distraction from the, the day job. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is a man who does know Italian politics and so on very, very well indeed as well as the arts. So how, how do you think the arts are viewed and people like you are viewed in Italy? Well, I think that we have to make it clear one point um, when we talk about culture, generally speaking, that is uh, literature, music, uh, and other things like this. They are things that we do for free. They are things that um, uh, exist, um, even if we are paid for, for doing that, um, that uh, exist out of a dimension of money and uh, exchange of money, and they have to do with the how can I say? Human nature. I remember, uh, maybe you remember as well, uh, a scene of the famous movie Dead Poets Society with uh, Robin Williams when he says, we don't read and write poetry because it is nice. We read and write poetry because we are humans. And this is the main issue from my point of view. It has got to do with our human nature and uh, it, of course it matters, but it doesn't matter only because we need culture to improve our society. We need culture for universities or for publishing houses or to break borders. That is a very good thing, of course. Thing, of course. And uh, this is the reason why we must be really worried about that technical point of view that uh, says, of, okay, in Italy we had... Uh, a ministry of finances that said you can't eat with culture. That is the most stupid and dangerous thing that a politician can say. Because of course, often you don't eat with culture. Many times you can eat, of course. But uh, the problem is uh, the survival of human nature as we know it and as, as we want to keep it. This is the main reason why it matters. Misha, in this country, we don't talk uh, much about culture. Our politicians are rather wary of ever talking about going to the opera. Um, they're allowed to go to football matches, I think. Um, but why is it that the status of culture is so low in this country, in public life? And should it be part of the debate about Europe, about the EU now? Well, I don't believe that, uh, you know, that you can hope that uh, uh, a couple of episodes of Borgen or the Bridge is going to shift the debate about, about the referendum. That is not going to happen. Culture has an impact over a much longer period of, of, of time, and it requires more serious understanding in a way than the immediate punch and duty issues of the debate that we've got at the moment with the... Uh, with the referendum. Um, in the United Kingdom, uh, and indeed in, in the Republic of Ireland as well, we consume an enormous amount of culture and we produce an enormous amount of culture. And so whilst it, it may be outside of a narrow political discourse, I don't think it's outside of 
uh, of a social discourse at all. And I think virtually everything that any of us write has some degree of influence from, uh, from elsewhere, and otherwise it would be uninteresting. You would be keeping a very, very narrow gene pool, pool and reproducing the same stuff uh, uh, all, of the, uh, all of the time. But the other thing is a very important point, and that is about the European Union and the European project being unable to project itself culturally. And this is really significant. Gianrico was pointing to uh, the essence of humanity, which is what separates us from, uh, from Neanderthals, for example, is it's the ability to communicate things through stories. Uh, and that is how we are able to organize ourselves in much, in much bigger communities than, uh, than our ancestors uh, were. And so uh, to exclude culture, whether it's the you know, ignorance of a finance minister uh, in Italy or it's the uh, um, it sort of lack of willing of British politicians, uh, seems to me to be self-defeating both in the, in the short term and the uh, and the long term. But on that European project, this is, because I agree with Geert, it is extremely unfortunate that it, the European project has been transmitted as a technocratic project. Because if you delve into history at all, if you look at the Balkans, for example, why do Michael Gove's projected partners in Albania and Serbia want to do everything in order to get into the European Union, which will leave Britain on its own, even without Albania, Serbia and Ukraine? Uh, it's because that they know their security, their ability to develop without the threat of extreme violence, lies in that, in that European community. Why have we not, why has Brussels, Strasbourg and all the money that it's had at its disposal, not being, able, not being able to pose an alternative culture to, one, uh, to, to those populist cultures which, under a bit of pressure, we see now popping up absolutely everywhere and very damagingly. That's what seems to be so extraordinary, Gert, doesn't it, that we are forgetting this culture, shared cultural heritage? Yeah, it is, uh, it is strange too. I, I think there is a kind, it is a reflection of a kind of panic because uh, uh, people are feeling uh, insecure uh, the, and the European Union, just what you said, uh, couldn't give an answer. But it, the European Union is really in, in, in disarray. And just those days, we, these days, we are thinking about uh, 30 years ago, the, the Chernobyl disaster. And it was Chernobyl was one of the things which start, the, 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 the people in the Soviet Union started to think and to hesitate about their project because this big Soviet Union couldn't handle it at all. Nowadays, we see exactly the same happening in the European Union. Uh, and that, that, wor that's not only, that worries everybody. Uh, Union doesn't have an answer on the Euro crisis, uh, cannot handle the refugee crisis, it's really terrible, and is throwing away just that values, which are so important. And talking about culture, I think uh, uh, now more than ever, it is f everybody who's working in the cultural field, we have to work together, writers, uh, playwrights, musicians even, movie makers, everybody to, to on this counter-offensive. It's absolutely, I mean, in, in Europe as in the UK, the, what we've been told would be completely successful, which is defining every value as a financial value, has completely failed and it's completely failing in Europe. Um, the, the thing that succeeded and kind of occasionally held us together is, is as, you, as, as everybody said, I mean, it's, and it's not that I'm, you know, I, you always say, oh, I'm an artist and I'll go on about how nice art is. But I mean, it does a very specific job. And if you do it right, it always does the same specific job. You talk particularly specifically about individual details in such a way that they resonate universally. And any human being reading it, as long as it's well translated, is with you. And nations gender, colour, time, all of that falls away and you're 
receiving this kind of weird love letter from somebody who isn't you, that you don't know anything about. And that is, is, is utterly unsociopathic. It's totally private. It can't be controlled. It goes with you possibly through the whole of your life if somebody's done it really properly. It's, it's in you as a thing that sustains you. I mean, people, for goodness sake, in, in, in concentration camps would go without food in order to go and have art. You know, it's the bread and roses thing. Yeah, you want bread, but you've got to have the roses. Otherwise, the bread isn't worth anything. Um, and then that will be very airy fairy, and oh, we don't like that. But I mean, it creates it, it creates money. But the other thing it creates is 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 the law. You know, um, how would you understand dignity if you didn't have the dignity of of feeling that you were important as a person, that people had possibilities and potential, and weren't you know well, people if, screaming if at each other on television? The... But I mean that you know that sorry, but yeah, no. you know it's that produces human rights law. Otherwise, why, why would you think that human beings should have rights? You know, the, the, the devalued, politicized culture is basically only ever telling you that most human beings don't. Art always tells you that every child that drowns, everyone who gets shot, anyone who's bombed by anyone, it's not good, it's not ever good. Something utterly irreplaceable has always been lost, which of course politicians don't like, because then it's not simple and everything has consequences. But welcome to reality. That's what fiction tells you about in great detail, reality and the fact that everything you do has consequences. It's that ability to look at, look at somebody else. And obviously in Britain, we have a massively dissociated political c c caste who cannot put themselves in anybody else's position. Um, you know, it's this huge difficulty. Um, you know, art has not touched them. Um, but that, you know, it's, it's, it becomes political, political because when cultures fail too much, then the human rights laws have to come in after whatever horrible thing has happened. If you go back to, I mean, dare I say, to the, to the Greeks, to the Romans, to the Renaissance, and some of those were all shared European projects. We were part, of, we are, we were part of that. I mean, what I can't understand is how narrow our focus is now in the UK. Um, I, mean, I don't know whether I have any support from, the, from uh, my English friends here, or Scottish friend even, but... Um... Are you simply talking about people in, in, in Parliament? Because culture has a huge impact on everyone's everyday, everyday lives here. People are always talking about TV, about books, about, uh, about the theatre, about even... I mean, I would argue that some sporting events uh, have an aesthetic dimension to them, which is sometimes underplayed. And so uh, I often think that through those sorts, of, those sorts of things, you can learn about the way that people perceive each other, they per perceive themselves, and so on and so forth. So in that sense, broader culture. So, Rosie, I mean, I don't agree with your, with your premise that we're not interested in culture. I think we're all, uh, you know... Uh, That's good. We're right. all we're absorbed we're in culture. Can, can, I mean, we're, culture matters. I mean, I think it's a given. Of course it is, and um, and does and the problem is the other problem is we get Europe mixed up with the EU all the time, which is what we're doing now, I believe, with um, the European Union. I mean, can I just ask whether any of you here on the panel think that um, you know Hungarian, Dutch, and Italian friends whether, should should why would you like us to stay in? But for sure, because we are talking at the very beginning of our conversation about borders, any kind of borders that uh, are a good thing break. Uh, what I think is absolutely crazy is recreating borders that didn't exist anymore. And, uh, but uh, when it comes to culture as a practical tool, because it can also be a practical tool, we can, for example, think to the language. Studying language uh, seems something very, very theoretical, very academic, and it is an incredibly practical thing to do. If we think to politics, and generally speaking, we think to power, understanding how power speaks, and I'm talking about politics, I'm talking about law, I'm talking about journalism and uh, other things, understanding how this fields of human actions work about the language is very useful literally to change the world. This issue of language has a particular role and it's very important. Since the rise of English as 
the primary global language. This has actually distanced us. It has helped to distance us from Europe because we have one of the lowest translation rates when it comes to uh, literature uh, uh, on the continent. If you go to Germany, the number of books that are, are brought in, not just from the United Kingdom, the United States and, and France and Italy, but from the Czech Republic, from Hungary, from Poland, from Russia, is far, far greater than, than here. And of course, the other thing is, is, is that our language learning capacity is lamentably poor in this country, comparable, if I may say, unfortunately, with some of the Latin countries like Italy, Italy, Italy and Spain. But if you look at the sweep of Northern Europe and their ability to learn not just fellow uh, Germanic languages, but Latin languages and beyond as, as, as well, we, are cut, we have cut ourselves off because of our language. It's not been a, a conscious thing, although decisions to, to downgrade language learning in schools have been a, a cultural vandalism in, in, my, in my belief. And I think that this has underlined a certain alienation from, from Europe, the fact that we do not speak European languages now, even as much as we did 30 or 40 years ago. And I think it's a great, great shame. Um, now, we're going to hear a few readings as well, which we're going to dot through the, the conversation. I think that's probably a, a good chance to, um, to talk to Misha a little bit more about, about his writing, because um, Misha was the BBC's Central Europe correspondent and uh, Guardian correspondent. And I worked for a BBC programme called, Radio 4 programme called Europhile. And for months and months, we just trekked around Europe in these dirty boots and, <coughs> and thick coats, reporting on the extraordinary events. And... Um, these are my own two treasured copies from the early days of Misha's book, The Rebirth of History and the Fall of Yugoslavia. And Misha's actually got my own copy of his book, The Balkans, which he's going to read from. Um, and as you probably know, if you've followed Misha's uh, story, he's gone on to write about um, dark matter, uh, global organized crime, cybersecurity and communication, um, Russia. But we're going back in time to the Balkans, to Yugoslavia, um, the rebirth of history. It was an absolutely fantastic moment where Europe did come together for a, for a very brief period, although even in 1989 I was already clocking what was happening in, in Serbia and Croatia with, uh, with real concern uh, at, at the time. Um, uh, and... Uh, but uh, you know, it's it's rare that one that one experiences such e extraordinary cataclysmic events that take place in a very short space of time, but have huge um, huge uh, implications. I mean, the world that I grew up in, the world of the Cold War, is so very different from the world that my children have have grown up in, and it's very it's very difficult trying to explain to people of this generation exactly what the Cold War was, because in one sense, in retrospect, you think you know the stability and the certainty of the Cold War is actually now kind of a wonderful thing. Um, it, it, it was compared to, uh, in this sense, in as much that we have now entered a world where we can, where technology has expanded things to such a degree where scale is beyond anything that we've ever imagined before, that we are finding it extremely difficult to grasp what is going on. And things are happening very fast, and I mean through that, I mean technological, technological development. And if you look at Europe, the refugee crisis, nobody was expecting this. Nobody has imagined it. It reminds everybody of the, of the Second World War, and our institutions have uh, revealed themselves to be lamentably incapable of dealing with any of this. And what it is doing is it is driving, this is leaving aside Brexit, this is, it's driving Europeans apart and atomizing this great project, which is very dangerous for the, uh, for the whole world. Um, I was thinking of, of reading a, a, a little passage from the Balkans about just that 100 years ago, about Sarajevo. But in fact, I then decided that it would be more fun to read something about, this is an article that I wrote about 10 years ago for the, for the London Review books. In the mid-80s, when we still lived in that stable bipolar world, 
I was hiking in a remote part of Montenegro. As I surveyed the beauty of the mountains around me, a smiling shepherd boy, 10 years old at most, approached me in an evident state of excitement and keen to talk. Taking out an imaginary machine gun, he sprayed make-believe bullets in a semicircle and delivered a message that echoed around the Dinaric peaks. <coughs> Blake, Crystal, all dead. The boy bore news from distant Hollywood. The elders of the Carrington clan, the central characters in Dynasty, had met a sticky end. The crime that induced shock in audiences across the United States had not been perpetrated by a crazed Vietnam vet. If it had, perhaps Americans could have made some sense of the tragedy. But members and friends of Denver's richest family had been gunned down by terrorists in the distant Balkans. The heinous act was carried out in a house of God, no less, as Blake and Alexis's long-lost daughter was marrying the crown prince of Moldavia. Most of the cast were brought back from the dead in the subsequent episode by the insatiable desire for network ratings. All this happened just a hundred miles from Dracula's castle. This could only happen in the Balkans. The television producer who had wanted to massacre the cream of Colorado society was one Camille Marchette. I'm responsible for Moldavia, she told America's TV Guide in 1986. I sat down one day and said, I'm only going to be on the show a year and I'm going to end it with a shootout in Moldavia. Did she know that Moldavia was a real place which would gain its independence just five years after the wedding was filmed? Did she dream up the name King Galen? Were the terrorists who imprisoned Crystal and Alexis communists, nationalists, Romanian-speaking Serbs perhaps? The answer is that it doesn't matter as long as you're writing about the Balkans. <laughs> <laughs> How would you assess what, you know, how, how Hungary sees the rest of the EU now? Is, I mean, Hungary joined the European Union in 2004 um, and it has, you know, obviously made its voice known, particularly through Fidesz and so on. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it was a very interesting time for me last uh, September when uh, actually uh, Hungary uh, um, was pushed into the role of the policeman of the European Union and uh, if we talk about the European culture there there was much talk about uh, uh, that European culture is threatened uh, by this this crisis there are people who say that that it is something is threatened and something is over and our world is over and European culture is over Maybe it's true, but we have to live uh, together with this notion that, in a way, the, the way uh, European culture used to be is over. But we have to look forward to something else, I guess. Naomi um, Sechi and I met um, a few years ago at um, the, I think the first time was the European Literature Night at the British Library. Mm -hmm. And Naomi's book, The Finno-Ugrian Vampire, um, which is this one here. This is the one that she presented at European Literature Night, which is, um, by the way, taking place for the eighth time um, on May the 11th as part of the European Festival. So I hope you all come along to that. And this is the only book that's been translated into English, which goes back to what um, you know, Misha and um, Alice were saying about translation. This part is about the, the education of a young, uh, and, uh, young vampire with artistic leanings. And, uh, and it's about uh, her, her or his British uh, schooling. <laughs> Winterwood, that's where I spent the most impressionable, impressionable years of my life and consciously prepared for my deep cover, one that would satisfy both me and my surroundings, the writing of stories. Winterwood is a small and, small and undistinguished college in a small town in the south of England. My grandmother sent me there because she had heard on the grapevine that the very reincarnations of the Bronte sisters taught there, and that it, that was therefore perfect for an aspire, aspiring story writer. I must 
admit that grandma was a conscientious guardian who left no stone unturned to ensure that I become a well-educated corpse. I can there be a more ideal place than England, than England, all that wealth of accumulated experience. Thanks to the international character of the student body, I learned how to swear in French and I have ever since vented the frustrations occasioned by minor irritants in this language, as I don't like to utter obscenities openly. So I sometimes say, what a load of Lacan, a positive pack of Derrida, or if I stub my toe on a piece of furniture, I exclaim, Foucault. <laughs> I could go on and on about all the practical skills I acquired, but naturally I also strove to gain theoretical knowledge too at this institution. In general, I stayed in the library until closing time, and at the weekends I lay on my bed devouring the monologues of water rats and moles, the braggadocio of toads, the heroic deeds of daredevil house mice, the puns of chess pieces, the adventures of irrepressible redheads, the tragic fate of or orphans, the mystical stories of kobolds and hobgoblins. And then there were the countless distinctive rabbits. In the end, I wrote my dissertation on the manifestation of rabbit in British children's <laughs> literature with special reference to Victorian and Edward Edwardian era, discussing, among others, the rabbits of Beatrix Potter, Lewis Carroll, A. A. Milne, but also including more anonymous figures who might have cropped up only as an elder rabbit, for example. <laughs> My supervisor was unsympathetic to my topic. First of all, she took great glee in pointing out that the fact that A. A. Milne's cult work was written in 19, uh, 1926. Hence, the authorita authoritarian rabbit figure in it was not Edwardian, but Georgian. <laughs> the woman was an expert on bears, and since she had read somewhere that it was the Finneugrian's custom to hold bear fe feasts, she suggested that my topic should be the brown furred predator, saying that I might even have had personal experience of the bear cult. However, I had no such memories, since in Hungary, where I spent a significant part of my childhood, there are none of these honeypowed creatures to be found, quite apart from the fact that such a topic would have involved dealing with the absolute blockhead Winnie the Pooh, who simply <laughs> makes me want to ratch. <laughs> the rabbit is a dull-witted, foul-smelling, <coughs> and lascivious animal that appears in stories as a flesh-and-blood character possessed of human frailties, not as some idiot stuffed with stow dust. I would be very glad if everyone would at last admit that rabbits are just fearless and venturesome as ordinary domestic rodents. Indeed, they have far more complex personalities. I don't deny by virtue, vir virtue. virtue of, their size, of their size, mice enjoy something of an advantage, but one must not underestimate the natural endowments of rabbits either, as these can be inestimable inestimable for the purposes of character building. The conception of my work was in fact based on such attributes. Thank you, Naomi Sechi, and that was translated by Peter Sherwood. Um, Hjartemak is what I call a great European. And he is one of the most celebrated and successful um, writers in the Netherlands, historians, traveler, commentator. Um, and the Dutch call him our national history teacher. Um, I called him a national treasure before that. But um, you're going to read to a little bit from the yes. end of In Europe. Um, and why have you chosen this particular part? This was, we're talking over 10 years ago now. I could have written it uh, yesterday. And uh, it is not because... I was so clear-sighted or something like that, but because you could see some problems coming. Because it was that, in that time, it was still, before the referenda, 2005, it was still an uh, atmosphere of triumphalism. We couldn't do anything. The Americans have always their exceptionalism, exceptionalism 
We are the God-blessed, most fantastic country in the world. And the Europeans have, we have won the, we have won the Cold War. And that was, mood was still going on in the beginning of this century. So we got the Euro without a good political frame. We got Schengen without a good political frame. But, but yeah, again, I think uh, we Dutch, uh, we look quite a lot like the British. We are also a little bit afraid of the continent. We are a small country, uh, so we are always afraid to be eaten up by the other countries. And for us, uh, apart from all the other arguments, it will be really a problem for the Dutch when the British would leave because a story will win. When the British will leave the European Union, the story will win that you can go back to the uh, 19th century <laughs> and that you can leave the 21st century again. And also in my country there are people who dreaming that magic dream, but it is magic. Mm. I have often had the feeling that despite our common heritage and our present day context, Europe, as it was in the spring 1914, exhibited a greater cultural unity than it is just today, more than 90 years later. It was 10 years ago. Then a worker in Warsaw led more or less the same life as a worker in Brussels. And the same went for a teacher in Berlin or in Prague, a shopkeeper in Budapest or in Amsterdam. Our common disaster can be summarized briefly. Around 1900, there was a tree and an apple, and everyone ate of it. At the heart of Europe lay a young, unstable nation that did not recognize its own destructive possibilities. Two hellish wars followed, and we all experienced them in our own way. After that, for the East began four de deadly decades, while for Western Europe the gates opened into a paradise of mopeds, electric mixers, cars and televisions. Close to the end of the century, the wall fell, but for millions of Eastern Europeans hard times arrived again, the years of humiliated men, frightened women and broken families. At the same time, the West was celebrating the boom of the 90s without realizing what their Central and Eastern European kin were suffering. Immigrants came from other cultures and went. Closed societies were broken open. There arose a new set of dynamics with new tensions. In short, we still have a great deal to tell each other and a great deal to explain. And all that had yet to begin. This last winter, I was back in Vazorodspeet, a Hungarian village. The whole story starts there too. In the cafe, people were whispering that the owner, owner planned to close the place in May. A, <coughs> European regulations demanded the installation of strictly divided men's and women's toilets. And there was no way that she could afford that. Lajos and Red Josef had passed away. 60 is a, res is a respectable age for men there. They lay in the churchyard beside, beside the veteran who had found dead one summer morning flat on his face on, in the road. The post office had closed down and the school was about to close. There were houses for sale everywhere. People want to leave. Our friend who lives there had written, others are dying or already dead. The German grocery chain Lidl, long live Europe, had invaded Hungary with dozens of supermarkets, all of them brand spanking new, all of them opening at once. By selling vegetables and other projects at barely cost price, they were now grinding the small shopkeepers to a pulp. The green grocer and the little shops in the neighboring Sivitgar were going under. But there was good news as well. <coughs> the major had found a source of European funding. A new cultural center was rising up in the middle of the village. A big <laughs> building with shiny roof tiles. Almost all the men had work now. The wages were going up. Even the toothless men had a steady job. Everyone 
had become a little bit more prosperous, except for the postman's wife. Her cow had died. One of the Dutch people who lived there also had already offered to buy her house, just to have a little extra space. The last stretch of the sandy road had been paved. The council had purchased a mowing machine. The gypsies with their uh, <coughs> sorry, the gypsies with their skits had dis disappeared. The moments of quiet had become rare. Apples fell from trees into the grass. No one came to pick them up anymore. No children even came to gather them. They had never seen anything like that around here. Tonight we have two book launches, not just one, we have two book launches. Um, and we, uh, that's why I'm ending with these, um, with these two wonderful writers, with Gianrico Carapiglio and with A.L. Kennedy. Um, Gianrico, as I said before, has just published, is here to launch this book, um, A Fine Line. First of all, I need to tell you that um, Gianrico comes from Puglia. Now, um, do you call yourself Puglian or Italian or...? European? Myself? Yourself. I, I don't like the idea of, um, of being, uh, let's say, of, of a specific place. In, it, in Italian we have a word that is patria, uh, that is the place of the fathers, uh, that means uh, belonging to something. But I don't like this word, I don't like the word patria, the place of fathers, because I uh, like uh, much more uh, the place of songs. The place of songs? Songs. And there is a, 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 an old uh, um, Native American say, a tell, that makes something like this. Uh, we did not inherit this uh, country from our, our fathers. We borrowed from our sons. It is something that I really like about the idea of belonging to something, belonging to the world. But I, I don't want to sound rhetorical, but I, I wouldn't say I am Pugliese or Barese or even Italian. I like the idea of belonging to something that is more mixed. And European? Yes, mm, but it, it, yes, if I have to choose, I prefer a European among these. The, the main character of five uh, novels of mine that have all been translated into English, is a Guido Guerrieri that is a defense attorney, uh, a kind of a complicated guy um, with um, contradictory uh, parts of his, of his um, character. And uh, basically, he's um, a reluctant hero. He doesn't want to he's be a hero. He's a reluctant hero. hero. reluctant yes. hero, just. Uh, I'm, of course, I have no Italian accent. I know that you like the Italian accent, and I pretend to have <laughs> Italian. You're doing, you're doing very well. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm, I'm playing Italian. This, this story is about uh, the is Guido Guerrieri that takes the defense of a, a judge uh, who is charged with corruption, and he accepts the defense because he is sure that his client. Uh, is not guilty, uh, that uh, there are false allegations against uh, him. And then part of the so-called suspense of the story, it's about discovering that probably the things are more complicated and uh, this will uh, bring a lot of moral issues. And so I decided to, to read two small pieces, a serious one and a less serious one. You, I hope you will understand which one is serious. <laughs> <laughs> I was in my office with one of the trainees, the latest to arrive, and the grandson of an old school teacher of mine, who had asked me to take him on. Unfortunately, considering the nature of the request, I hadn't been able to object, even though the young man had the expression of a psychotic pigeon <laughs> and the pernicious 
habit of wearing the same shirt for two or three days, mm -hmm. with all the olfactory consequences you would expect. Mm -hmm. We were discussing the first document I had entrusted him with drawing up, an action for fraud with a request for the seizure of a number of bills of exchange. The young man had thrown himself into the task with great enthusiasm, or enthusiasm, enthusiasm, but also with a somewhat idiosyncratic, even Dadaistic interpretation of grammar and syntax. <laughs> the voc vocabulary wasn't any better. It was full of expressions like aforesaid, above mentioned, herein enclosed, your lordship, and things like this. Why do you use these expressions, Federico? What expression, Avocato? I lifted through the action and pointed almost at random at a line towards the end of the document. This, for example, may your lordship be congratulated on granting the seizure of matter as a matter of urgency. He threw me his best pigeon look and remained silent. All you have to say is, we ask for this seizure as a matter of urgency. If you meet a flesh and blood prosecutor, do you say to him, good morning, your lordship? <laughs> and this is another part. Very funny the, yeah. <laughs> that was and uh, this is another one, very short. So a client of yours is accused of judicial corruption. You defend him, convinced of his innocence. Then you discover that he is guilty. <coughs> what to do? Keep defending him or give up the brief? Basically, it's a quite simple question. Maybe not so simple, though. To start with, would you have the same dilemma if you discovered that a client of yours accused of robbery <coughs> had indeed committed that robbery and maybe had also committed many others? If you actually discovered that he was a professional robber, no, you wouldn't. <coughs> Why not? Because there is a distance between you. He, the robber, isn't part of your world, the world of trials, rules, and justice. But a corrupt judge is. A corrupt judge, not his existence, but the fact that he is your client, that his fate depends partly on you, undermines the system, the structure, the whole theatre where you have played your role until now. If that man continues to be a judge, how can I continue to be a lawyer? Um, we have our second book launch. Um, you are Scottish as opposed to English, so the very first time I met you I got that wrong. <laughs> Do you see yourself as, I mean, you live in London and... I, I live in the uh, vast opportunity for investment, which is London. Um, You're part of the creative industries. I am a, a creative in, industrialist in uh, <laughs> an investment opportunity. London itself is, is people from everywhere. London is, is huge populations from different, I mean, the number of French people, it's, it's, this is a very large French city. Um, and a very large, you know, Chinese city, and a very, and it, yeah, and um, Polish, and every, and Polish, and uh, you know, different stories f for different waves of immigration. Um, London remains London. The idea that oh, this wave will mean our way of life is over, uh, but then ten years later, this wave will mean our way of life is it. So what happened to our way of life ten years before? And then another ten years. Oh no, those people are going to destroy our way of life. It's like, well, but well, how is it keep surviving? But I, the, the reason I'm mentioning that is at the moment, uh, if you're from Glasgow, you're a Ouija. They have this scheme called Refugees, where people adopt a refugee. Uh, and because they have no family anymore, you become their family. You become their mother or their father or their sister or your brother. Um, it's been hugely successful and beautiful uh, and makes me very proud to be human, never mind having lived for a while in Glasgow. And it, it's a completely different, <laughs> different way of doing things, but it's like what happened in Vienna. Uh, people came together because we have technology now and said, you know, these people are coming through with faces that when you've seen those faces, you know where they've come from. So, uh, you know, old people, young people, people with time got together, 
got shops to provide food, found clothes. Lots, suddenly, people who've never met before organized themselves very quickly, because you can now, to create a mini refugee transit camp. And immediately, the response to that was, well, there are people who are homeless in Vienna. And the beautiful and wise response to that was, they can come too. So you had basically alcoholics and people fleeing a civil war, the two sets of people who lose their friends and family and bomb their own lives, who have a kind of congruity. Um, and that makes a huge amount of sense, but it's, it makes no money. So you don't hear about it. And that's the, that is the tragedy of Europe, is that we don't get those narratives so loudly. This book, um, this is your seventh novel. It's a big novel it's a love story it's set in london no it's a it's a it's i mean it's a love story and it's sort of uh they're serious about it. it's it's the serious variety of sweet that's not the packageable marketable type of love it's the thing that's difficult and jangly that isn't hollywood that's not a commodity it's people being people and and within london because you because london is so hard and it's so vicious and it's very difficult and people are stepping over people who are not only homeless but crying and that's weird to say the least um people are terribly gentle i spent one of the only nice things about the book is that there are little bits where it's de descriptions of people being kind Random acts of kindness are all over London, and I spent a year looking for the random acts of kindness, and obviously if you do that, you find them. People are fantastically pleasant to each other because otherwise London would combust and we'd eat each other within hours. The, the father has taken his daughter on holiday to Berlin. His daughter is already going, oh God, you've taken us to Berlin. He's obsessed with uh, genocide and how it happens, and he's a civil servant, and he works for the Department of Work and Pensions. Uh, <laughs> And he is therefore falling in half. Um, so this is the beginning of him having a day where he has a nervous breakdown. Um, bless him. Like he and Duncan Smith, weeping, suddenly overwhelmed with six years of compassion. Um, so bless him. She had a perfectly valid point. It was probably not fair to pick a hotel, albeit a perfectly acceptable hotel with good reviews, primarily because it stood on the site of what had been the Jüdischen Brüderverein until its forced sale in 1938. And a forced sale did leave an atmosphere of a kind, the pestilent kind. And then because those intoxicated by the use of force develop a taste for irony, nurture a specialist and heavy-handed brand of humor, the building was taken over by the Reichssicherheitshauptamt Department 4B4, the department responsible for Jewish affairs which oversaw the seizure of Jewish homes and possessions and the removal of their German citizenship. If there's a department for you, then you must be a problem. A solution to you must be sought. So he and his daughter were, yes, sleeping, not quite where Adolf Eichmann slept, but where he worked, where he and his administrators, his planners and implementers, his civil servants worked. Becky and John had been eating there warm little Kaiser rolls, warm little Berlin Schrippen, and their hot boiled eggs that morning inside the shadow of a building where human beings in clean and orderly surroundings had proved unable to connect their paperwork with other human beings elsewhere, or with reality, or with pain. As I've gone on so much, I'll probably stop there, actually. <laughs> there we go. Can I just say one thing? If Brexit takes place, if we leave, then it is up to cultural figures and all sorts of other people to redouble their efforts to maintain the connections between the United Kingdom uh, and the rest of, of Europe because life will go on. But we really have to work for this. And, and as Alison said, uh, I haven't been engaged with British politics at all over the past 20 or 30 years. As from next week, I'm going to start coming out with all guns blazing in terms of doing what I can to keep this country inside the European Union and not to allow this petty-minded uh, little Englander, and it is primarily little Englanderism, to, uh, to uh, override our kids' interests. And that's the other thing. 70% of children 
uh, of, of young people between aged 18 and 30 are for European Union membership, yeah. but they don't vote. Yeah. Whereas when you get to 55 and over, then it flips mm -hmm. and they do vote. And they are going to take away the rights of those young people. And so I am going to come out fighting. Um, um, I didn't want to force anybody into a final statement because I think it's a really difficult thing to do um, and we are running over but as Misha has started us off I would actually like you all to make a final statement there was a, a sentence a quote that I it is my, in my first novel it's a quote I mean like a quote by Marrow and uh, again, I'm translating from the translation, <laughs> but uh, I think it has got to do with things we were talking about tonight. And uh, it makes uh, something like this. The country of a man who can choose is there where the largest clouds arrive. This is wonderful from my point of view, and it, mm -hmm. it, it means exactly what I meant when you asked me, <coughs> you feel Italian or Pugliese or um, European. It's where the largest clouds arrive. Say it in Italian for us. La patria di un uomo che può scegliere è là dove arrivano le nubi più vaste. Grazie mille, grazie tantissimo. I want to support Misha <laughs> and uh, I think we have all to come out all guns blazing uh, for Europe also uh, to, to, to survive uh, together and um, in, in my country the same kind of discussions are going on and perhaps I, when I would have been a British cartoonist I will go to for a weekend uh, to the Netherlands, and there you see the same discussions on if, but because this country is in, on, in such a small scale, the discussions are already funny. Uh, you <laughs> hear politician, the politician, the politicians talking about, we are uh, um, uh, uh, negotiate again with uh, Ukraine, we go to Turkey. And then, uh, so, so, you know, uh, it's a very small country, it's a very small party, but this strong national we feeling, you see it also in this, uh, in, in, the, in the country, and you see also the magic thinking. Uh, we must be more independent of, uh, of Europe. Uh, um, and you see at the same times, all those uh, millions of lorries crossing the border to Germany. You see the econ economy is totally interconnected. So it is, it is a dream. It is totally a dream. So go a weekend to the Netherlands, not to Amsterdam. That's very international. But list, try to listen to the people and you see suddenly for great, for the Dutch it doesn't work for sure, but also when there would be a Brexit, Great Britain would be also a small Holland at the end. And nobody would want that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mary Sachi. A country which uh, always has been a, an intellectual inspiration for, for Europe. Can I say that uh, uh, it, it doesn't care about all those countries? Uh, uh, because it would be uh, a sign of arrogance, uh, I guess, uh, that the uh, um, UK is needed for Europe, but UK doesn't need uh, Europe. So that, that would be a kind of uh, arrogant isolation for me. Uh, I mean, I, I really hope that people don't... Uh my, my feeling is that we we aren't going to leave. It, it would be a disaster. It would mean the breakup of the UK. We'd have to renegotiate peace with the uh, would you go back to Northern Scotland? Ireland. Would you, would you uh, still stay? Yeah, no, I'd probably have to leave because I I, I horribly suspect that what's the re one of the real things that's, that's happening is this attempt to 
um, have absolute power amongst a small number of extremely unwise people. So England would become a very unhappy place. And Scotland's, uh, the material relationship between Scotland and England would have changed. So you'd get another independence vote. You, you, you would end up with a very strange, uh, potentially very isolated England, which would be not very good. I mean, hopefully, because so many people are on the verge of losing so many things, um, things become very simple in these terrible times and the important things become very important. And in a way, <coughs> it's beautiful because you wake up and it's beautiful because you know, well, for a start, that beautiful things are important. Beauty is important. Misha Glenny, um, Gianrico Carafilio, Giat Mack, Naomi Secchi and A.L. Kennedy. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.